Welcome to this WFOTVX. We're so delighted that you've joined this webinar. We will be presenting on podcasting today. And I'm Karen Jacobs, the moderator, but I'll also be presenting. I'm in Boston, and I just want to direct you to the chat box where I hope you will put down your name, where you live, and any experience you have with podcasts. And throughout our presentation, I hope that you'll post questions and we'll do our best to answer them. So again, welcome to WFOTVX. So there's three of us as speakers today. Brock, Stephanie, and I are all podcasters. We're going to give you some background on podcasting, and then we're going to share our own lived experiences on having pod a podcast. So, Stephanie, it's all yours. Hi, everybody. I am broadcasting from Memphis, Tennessee in the USA and want to talk to you for a minute about what a podcast is and give you a little bit of background on that. A podcast is generally described as a series of digital audio files that can be accessed online and downloaded and then listened to on any kind of electronic device. The term podcast itself was coined in around 2004 by a British journalist named Ben Hammersley through a combination of the two words iPod and broadcast. So that gave us the podcast. Around the same time, podcast carriers like iTunes and Stitcher have helped to propel this type of media into popularity. And these days there are millions of downloads of live or on demand podcast on a daily basis. So podcasting has really exploded and I feel like that's in large part due to the range of topics that you can find in podcasts, the, the flexibility and ease of use and how accessible it is and the fact that most podcasts can be accessed for free. And all of that make the medium a really viable platform for learning and connecting, and we're going to talk further about those things as we go through the, the presentation. So, Stephanie, would you like to share the skills for podcasting with our listeners? Yes, I'll talk briefly about this and then... Um, Brock, if you want to chime in, um, when we were planning for this presentation, we talked about how there is kind of a continuum of skills, and they range really for from one end of the continuum, which is the more soft skills, like being able to communicate with others, and that, and then the other end of the continuum is the hard or more techy skills. And Brock, did you want to add to that? Uh I well after this slide I'll I'll go through and explain I guess the the process of podcasting and see where those skills I guess fit into place if we wanted to just dive into that. But part, you know what I'm thinking? How about <clears throat> each of us identifying where we are? I have to say I am, and this is Karen. I am definitely the soft skilled person. I am very enthusiastic. <laughs> I love interviewing. I do love uh, communication. I'm extremely curious. I try to be a good listener, but I have to say when we start getting to some of the harder skills, um, that's that's hard for me. Steph Stephanie, where are you? And, and Brock, where are you? I would say that I am right smack in the middle. Um, and probably some of that is because my clinical background is in assistive technology. And so, I am kind of a techie, but I also really like the interview and the connection and just, you know, learning from people who are guests and then listeners to the podcast. So I'm pretty much right dead set in the middle. Um, 
one thing I will say is that my clinical interview skills have really improved, I think, as a result of being an interviewer in the context of being a podcaster. So that's something I've noticed about myself. Uh, I, I think, and it's Brock, obviously, if you, <laughs> uh, I think that I fit, I think I also fit probably bang in the middle, but I have a strong, I'm a bit of a nerd. I have a strong interest in the hard skills. So the, the technology and learning, uh, new things with that regard is, is something that really, really interests me. Uh, and one of the main reasons why I started, but the, the soft skills, uh, very much translate from my clinical work. Uh, so yeah, I, th I think I'm overall probably bang in the middle, but I do have a strong interest in the in the hard skill side of podcasting. Yeah, and you know what, this is Karen again. I do have to re reapproach this. I I do like technology. I think I like um, doing podcasting because I have somebody who's doing a lot of the technology for me, but I do enjoy it as well and that challenge. So Brock, let's go on to the next um, slide, which is the process of a podcast. All right, so there's kind of two separate processes that we wanna have a look at. And this is the first one. And this tends to be the actual, this more of the soft skills, I guess, uh, included in this side of it. Um, and the, the first aspect of it is actually planning. Uh, so what do you, what's your podcast going to be about? What do you want to talk about? Um, one thing that I encourage people to do is if you're going to either engage in podcasts, even, even just listening to them, uh, or if you're planning on starting one yourself, is find something that you're passionate about because you want your podcast to, you know, have more than three episodes before you get bored and, and try something else. So if you find something that you're really passionate about, so for me, I'm really passionate about learning from other people's narratives. So my podcast is very much surrounded uh, by that. So it's uh, me interviewing OTs from all over the place and, and trying to learn things about their practice area or their area of expertise. Um, so find something you're you're passionate about, but plan out the actual podcast at the start, whether it's going to be, you know, lots and lots of little short ones, whether you're going to do more long form content, et cetera. Uh, the second aspect of that and the bit I think a lot of people get caught up on is recording equipment. Uh, you, when you're not trying to run a radio station, I guess. So <laughs> to get started, you can literally, most people have, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a mobile phone nowadays you can record a podcast on a mobile phone recording technique is probably more uh gonna have a, a bigger impact on your audio quality than the equipment that you're using yes equipment makes a difference but don't let that or the lack of equipment or the lack of what you think you might need equipment wise be the barrier to starting uh the content again comes back to that planning process so this is a, but this is more actually putting that into place so content for me uh i i don't tend to plan out the content because my focus is the interviews the content is whatever comes up during the podcast itself uh so making sure that you know you're you're directing things that are interesting and, and a general rule for me again comes back to that passion if it's interesting for me uh i've found that it tends to be interesting for <laughs> some of my listeners so uh, I will usually find conversations and make conversations that I find interesting myself. And then post-production editing, again, another thing, and this is probably more of the, the hard skill uh, aspect of podcasting. Uh, there's, it's one of those things where you can make it as complicated or as simple as you feel like you want to. So if you aren't really confident in it, you can do no editing if you really want to, uh, or you can start dipping your toe into things like compression and noise reduction and that kind of thing. Or you can be like me and be a complete nerd and try and learn everything at once. Uh, that is, I guess, a, the interest area for me is some of that learning how to audio edit. Um, there's lots of free programs around that you can do that with that are really, really good as well. So cost-wise, it's it shouldn't be a barrier. It's more just whether or not you're interested in, in learning that skill set. We'll go to the next slide, Karen. Uh, 
Uh, and then the process. So that was the process of actually making your little podcast. You've got it on in an MP3 file on your computer. What do you do with it now? So there's that file itself is housed on a media host. So it's an online uh, company that you essentially pay a monthly fee to, and we'll go through in a sec and have a look at um, the different companies that the three of us use and what sort of stuff they do for us. But essentially, they're, they're the ones that host that file. So we upload our, our podcast onto their cloud, I guess you'd say, uh, and they host it. Now, from that file, we each, as part of our website, will have an RSS feed. Don't ask me what RSS stands for. I haven't looked that up. It doesn't really matter in the long run. The concept is the RSS feed is kind of like uh, your uh, traffic director. So it's the feed that says when someone clicks on this link wanting to listen to your podcast, it directs them or directs their traffic to where that that uh, podcast file is actually housed. So if you've got a little podcast app on your phone and it tells you that the new episode is out, you click it to open it, it directs it to where that file is housed and downloads it for you. Makes a really, really complex situation really, really simple for the end user, which is awesome. Uh, that's about as simple as I can explain an RSS feed. Uh, Stephanie's just told me it stands for real simple syndication, which makes sense. Uh, the next aspect is the podcast directory. So where can you find, where is your podcast housed? Where can listeners find your podcast? Probably the, the, well, the biggest one uh, and the one that most people will be probably accustomed to is iTunes. Uh, owned by Apple, have been a really big player in the podcast space for a decade, probably longer now. Uh, but there's a lot more coming out, and some of them are picking up speed really, really fast. A lot of these directories will be essentially just linking to your RSS feed. Some of them will link automatically from iTunes. Some of them like Spotify, which some people uh, may be familiar with as a music streaming service. Uh, now uh, houses podcasts as well. Uh, so you can submit your podcast to Spotify and it links to your RSS feed as well. So podcast directories are kind of just the, the, I guess, the warehouses where people are able to go, whatever uh, of them people are most comfortable in using to find your podcast and use your podcast. And then obviously the end result is hopefully that your podcast gets into people's ears, which is the, the goal from the beginning. So, Brock, thank you for that process. Um, and what we thought we would do next, um, the three of us, is to have you um, hear our lived experiences with um, our podcasts. And so I'm going to kick it off. And um, I've got a little bit of a longer story. So in 1998, um, I um, developed a um something called Lifestyle by Design, which was a local access cable television show that um, I created as a way of promoting occupational therapy. And um, I actually did this um, local access cable show with my two teenage children, Josh and, and Ariel. Ariel at 12 was my co-host and Josh was in charge of all production. It ran for five years. And then the kids went off to um, school and said, we're not gonna do this anymore with you, mom. You know, we have other things to do. And I, you know, I sort of felt kind of sad, but I understood that. And so about four years ago, um, we brought Lifestyle by Design back on, um, on the air uh, through local access cable in Brookline, Massachusetts on BIG, and um, I started working with someone at BIG as my co-host, Andrea, um, and we filmed on a regular basis. And then about a year ago, Andrea said to me, um, you know, I really love podcasts and I listen to them all the time. And how about we have Lifestyle by Design, you know, morph into it being a podcast rather than 
uh, a local access cable show. And by the time, you know, we had Lifestyle by Design move to Brookline, Massachusetts on their their um, platform, um, Lifestyle by Design went on to YouTube. So we were getting a really great following. And I really loved the interviewing of people. And we, we um, went beyond just promoting occupational therapy and our tagline, which continued from 1998, was helping you solve everyday challenges. And so, you know, Andrea said, you know, let's try a podcast. We'll keep our regular um, cable show, but let's try it. Well, I went reluctantly into it, even though I, I listened to podcasts and, and enjoyed them. I really liked to be sitting in a room with somebody and interviewing them. I didn't realize that I could do that with a podcast. I don't know what I was thinking I could do. And I have fallen in love with it. And in fact, we have stop doing our local access cable show of Lifestyle by Design, and we are completely a podcast now. Um, we're going into our, our second season, which is exciting. Um, our host um, podcast service is Lisbon. It's about 15 US dollars a month. Um, we're located on uh, the Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and recently um, Stitcher. We have one to two episodes a month, and they're typically 20 to 25 minutes each. Our theme is helping you solve everyday challenges. So how do I market occupational therapy? Always introduce myself as an occupational therapist. I also introduce myself in my role um, at the university, um, Boston University, and also that I am a, a Rotarian. Um, I'm a member of a Rotary Club, and so I have those different roles, and that sort of helps me have my topics be very varied. Um, each episode introduces the listener to extraordinary people who are sharing stories of how they've addressed a challenge in their life, as well as professionals who share their expertise on handle big and small challenges. So. We have topics like, you know, self-help, um, you know, happiness, meditation, volunteerism, occupational therapy is is built into to many, many of them. And I hope you'll, you know, um, go on to our, our site. I hope you'll subscribe and listen to them. Um, they're quite interesting. Now, why did I decide to do this again? It, it was a change in our format from our cable show uh, lifestyle by design. And again, I'm very interested in promoting occupational therapy, but like Brock, I am totally fascinated, and Stephanie, totally fascinated by people's lived experiences, their narratives. And that's what I encourage people to um, share with us. Um, I find, um, and Brock mentioned this, I do a lot of recording on my phone. Um, I have a smartphone. I use voice recorder. Um, I'm able to record wherever I am. I, I remember um, being stuck in Paris coming back from a conference, standing in line bemoaning with another person that we had to be late and it was going to be, you know, so late when we got back to Boston. And by the time we finished, I heard about his new book coming out. And by the time we boarded the plane. I had already made an appointment with him to um, have an interview about his new book. So I guess the the joyfulness of having a podcast um, is that wherever you are, if you have some kind of a recording device, you can um, ask people to share their lived experiences. So a little bit different than Brock and Stephanie, and they'll share um, more of the mechanics of theirs. I do have someone who produces our my podcasts or our podcasts. Um, I am the interviewer, but then I will upload my recordings to Dropbox, and then Andrea will put them together um, for an episode. And um, we have a studio. Um, it's my office that we set up, but typically I'm I'm portable. Um, and Andrea, when we meet in our studio. We pre-record an intro and an exit. And so it's easy for her to then do some editing of whatever I've recorded and, and drop it into the intro and exit. So um, that gives you a little bit of, of my story. Please feel free to 
post some questions as we're going through um, this, and I'm going to now uh, turn it over to Brock to share his story. Yep, if I can find the unmute button, there we go. All right. Um, so I originally planned on starting a podcast because I was a, an avid podcast listener, um, but I originally planned to start a podcast like four years ago um, in the context of looking at starting my own private practice and the podcast was going to be a, a part of that kind of thing. Uh, but for whatever reason, neither of those things happened, which is fine. Uh, and it came up again not too long ago this year, earlier this year, that, you know, this is something I've wanted to do for a long time. I'd already done a lot of research into how to do it. So I had a fairly good grasp on what to do. Uh, and a friend of mine kind of gave me a little shove and said, just just do it. Just put yourself out there. It's something you want to do. It's fun. If it doesn't work, so what? Um, it's not a, a, an overly catastrophic investment uh, if it doesn't happen to work or you don't happen to like it. So just give it a crack. So, so I did. Uh, my interest is, like I said earlier, is very much in learning from narratives. And I, I am one of those people that really loves going to conferences, mainly to network and for the conversations that you have outside of the sessions. And my, my idea with my podcast was what if I could capture some of those sorts of conversations because they're the, they're the conversations that I learn the most from. Um, so I, I wanted to share and originally my, my concept was if, you know, one person, one other person other than myself got something out of the conversations that I was having, then mission accomplished. I'll be happy with that. Uh, and now I am, I released my 20th episode yesterday. Uh, and things are, are going well. I'm very much enjoying it. One of the the main, another one of the main reasons that I started was I mentioned earlier as well. I'm a bit of a nerd. I very much enjoy the the tech aspect and the the challenge uh, of podcasting. It's something I'd never done before. I had no idea about audio engineering, uh, room treatment, microphones anything really so kind of starting that that challenge from from scratch was was a was was something that seemed like a fun challenge to me uh it, it's very much a creative project uh, i don't see it as you know work or anything like that it's something i really enjoy so i get the bonus of learning from the conversations that i have uh, as well as the the challenge of forever trying to, and if you do get into the podcast space, you'll you'll come across this where you're forever trying to improve your audio or improve your um, file size or improve. You're always trying to improve something, so it's a nice challenge. Um, in terms of the podcast, Occupied is released. Uh, I say it's fortnightly. I tend to get impatient and maybe release them a little bit earlier than that. So. It's usually two to three episodes per month, and they tend to vary. There's kind of two different types of episodes that I release. There's my interview, or no, I don't really call them interview. They're just sort of chats with with guests, which tend to go for about an hour and a half. Um, and I also have monologues, which tend to go for about 20 to 25 minutes. I... In those, we'll discuss you know, contemporary issues, usually things that I've seen online or sometimes papers that have come out recently that I want to have a discussion about. Um, so I have those kind of two. They tend to, there tends to be more interviews than monologues, um, and that's just purely and simply due to I find people more interesting than myself, really. Um, <clears throat> other than that, I've been able to get into sort of helping other people with their podcasts as well now. So I've um, helped out, uh, say, Sarah Putt, who start, runs the OT for Life podcast. Uh, she very much, she's been on my podcast, but she very much has a, a similar kind of format to hers. Uh, and so I, it, it, that's an interest area for me as well as actually sort of supporting other people to, to bring their podcasts and, and get into this space because I do think it's, a space that OTs 
aren't well uh, well established in yet, but it's a, a space that has a lot of potential. And I think Steph should be next. Yeah, Brock, thank you um, so much. And um, your mentorship of others, I think, is is really important. So thank you for sharing that. Stephanie, it's all yours. All right. So my podcast is called On the Air, and I always try to capitalize the O and the T in that title for obvious reasons. And I started the podcast um, almost a year and a half ago. Um, of course, I had thought about it for a couple of years before that and kind of had it as a professional goal, a one day maybe type thing. And finally, um, really found a little bit of pocket of time in my professional schedule. And also um, the university where I worked happened to set up a recording studio that really was set up for faculty members to record things that they were going to use in class. But I asked if I could use it for recording the podcast and and there wasn't a conflict. They didn't mind if I used it. And I, I still do use it a lot. I like it because it's soundproofed. And so even if there's conversation in the hall or you know, pretty much anything going on around me, I'm in a pretty quiet environment, don't have a lot of background noise when I'm able to um, record in this studio where I happen to be today. Um, so my my reason for starting a podcast is actually a little bit similar to Brock's. I, I consider myself an avid podcast enthusiast, and I when I started working at my current job, I had a close to an hour long commute each way. And just to fill the time on a daily basis, I started listening to more and more podcasts. And one day it struck me that there were, I couldn't find any regularly produced OT podcasts that were released on a regular basis. There were a couple out there that were very sporadic and, um, and, and But I was looking for something that would release on a predictable date so I could look forward to it and listen to it regularly because I like to do that with other non-OT podcasts and I, I feel like in that way I kind of get to know the host in a way. And I could not find anything that fit that description. So that's when I decided to um, plan one of my own. I did talk to several podcasters who are not OTs, but the hosts of some of the shows I listen to, and they walked me a little bit through the process, and I, I did a little bit of Googling and read a couple books on it and talked to a couple of um, technology experts who know about RSS and that kind of thing, and, and then I just dove in and figured it out really. Um, I did have somebody who is an IT specialist and help me a little bit figuring out how to create the intro and the exit part, which he calls the outro and, and how to take the recording into an edit file. And he, he walked me through that a little bit, but to, for the most part, I figured that out by playing around with it and I do my own editing and, you know, uploading and things like that. Um, somebody asked a question a minute ago about what the intro and outro exactly are. And those are little small clips of music. And often the music will have voice over so that usually the podcast host is talking over it, like, welcome to the show. And there's some kind of music playing in the beginning. And then the outro or the exit piece is the similar thing, but you're saying, thank you for listening. This is the conclusion of the show type thing. And so you take the main recording, it's like the biggest piece and drop that into um, the, the whatever type of software you're using. And then you pull in the first part, the intro, and the, the last part, the outro, and piece it together. So there are ways that software will allow you to do that without um, too much effort once you get the hang of it. So that's a little, little um, more about those two pieces. So mainly the platform of my podcast is, it's like an auto-ethnographic study in a way. It's a, it's a, 
people telling their own stories about how they found out about OT for the first time, how and why they decided to enter the profession. I like to ask them a little bit about their days as an OT student and then any questions that come up in the conversation about how they got from OT school to wherever they are now. So it often comes up that if they have some kind of specialty area of practice or some kind of research interest or if they've gone back to school, um, those things often come up in conversation. And, and like Karen and Brock, I, I keep most of it pretty informal in that I don't really write out questions um, other than following that rough outline with each guest. I have had a couple of non-OTs on the program. I've had a nurse and I've had an attorney who deals with a lot of um, lawsuits that might involve healthcare professionals, including OTs. Um, but for the most part, it's been OT practitioners. And um, one goal that I had over the past year was to increase the diversity in the num in the description of the guests that I get on the show, and I have been able to do that. And um, my goal going forward is to interview more non-OT practitioners that just have something to do with what we do in our field, and then eventually to expand to um, clients or caregivers who can share their stories in interacting with OTs. And I, and I think that would be something that might be interesting to listeners. Stephanie, thank you. And um, we, we see lots of questions. So what we'll try to do is answer them. What we thought you might enjoy um, seeing is um, a snapshot of our studios. Brock's is first, Stephanie's is in the middle, and mine is uh, on the end. And in fact, we recorded uh, recently, uh, the woman in pink in, in my photo is running for um, Boston City Council. And I just happened to meet her at a Rotary meeting and invited her to come on our show. She actually lives right down the street from uh, our university. So it was very simple to have her come in. And again, a shout out to Andrea, um, who's um, in, in the uh, picture as well, and then myself in, in red. So what we thought we'd do is, is try to answer some of your questions in a conversation here. So Brock and Stephanie, um, which question shall we, we put up? And, and start talking about? I can't see them, so you'll just have to tell me what they are and I'll answer them. I would, I would say let's start with how do you deal with computer glitches or technology glitches? Yeah. And as we all know, technology can be our best friend when it works, but it also can be our worst enemy when it doesn't. Yeah, oh, I've got to tell you, I've got a good story. So um, remember the, 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 the gentleman I, I met waiting in line um, from, uh, Paris to Boston. He agreed to to let me record him. Um, I did it over on the telephone, started my recorder. It was a fantastic interview. And then I said to him, just, you know, just wait another minute. Let me play it back to um, see what you think. And the recorder never recorded it. So I called that a big glitch. And I said to him, you know, please, you know, could you check your calendar? Do you still have a little bit more time? Can we record it again? Um, and so um, we did the second time there was no glitch, um, but we're pre-recording, we're not going live. So I think that that helps us with some of these technology glitches. Stephanie and Brock, how about yourselves? Um, yeah, I, I think Technology glitches are one of those things like you're never going to get rid of them, but you can put in safeguards to try and, and, and processes to try and mitigate them. Uh, I So a lot of my uh, conversations with other people tend to happen over the internet, whether it's Skype or Zoom. Um, so I'll do multiple recordings at once, obviously, um, kind of like a backup. So my the program that I'm using will record, whether that's Zoom or Skype, will record the audio. But also, and you can kind of see it under the boom arm on my very cluttered desk, I have a mobile recorder um, called a Zoom H5 that when I'm not 
out and about interviewing people in person, I will also hook that up to my computer and that will record almost like a second copy um, so that if something fails, and it has happened once where, well, human error, I actually forgot to record the on the, the Zoom uh, and I had to use part of my software recorded as a, as a backup. Um, so it's helpful to have those backup recordings but also I back up everything, everything, the whole, my whole podcast is pretty much run off my Dropbox. Um, I keep the original raw audio files uh, until, well, I always keep them because I'm a bit of a tech hoarder. Um, but I also have then the file that I, from the, pr the production program Audacity that I use to edit. Uh, and then I have the final MP3 file. So I, I have the, I guess the three stages of, of editing as well. So if I stuff something up, I can go back and um, I've still got the raw audio. So it's, it's a matter of starting. A lot of the time, the issues you're going to have a, a human error, like forgetting to record and that kind of stuff. We've all done it and we'll probably all do it again at some point. Um, but it's a matter of trying to, I guess, embed those those processes in to try and limit the the mistakes that, that can happen because there would be nothing worse than getting to the end of an amazing conversational interview and then realizing you don't actually have it oh thanks brock i was <laughs> brock Harris, so if he could have seen my face turn red um it would but it's interesting um that podcast that we did it was actually about social um uh media and um in this society and it was now uh, our most listened to podcast so i think he enjoyed it and probably promoted it but <laughs> I owe him. I owe him something. I'm not even sure. Hey, there's some more interesting questions, and I want to thank um, people for posting. We we've got some really ni nice ones here. So, um, Stephanie, which which one would you like? Um, I think we answered the Heidi's one about um, entrance and exit recordings. Um, yeah. We did some glitches also. Um, someone asked, besides our own podcast, what is our favorite OT? podcast that you listen to uh, well i listen to stephanie and brock's um and again there's there's many more ot ones coming up i listen to lots of other people that are non-ot um mm -hmm. uh, podcasts so brock or stephanie do you have a, another special ot podcast you like to listen to i listen to um living life to the fullest the aota one when it comes out and um that's probably the main one besides y'all's two that um, I do listen to. And I, I have such a long queue of non-OT podcasts that I, I can't commit too much to too many of them. So, But I like to skip around and it fascinates me the different interview style and even just the tone of voice that different hosts use. So as more and more come out into the market, I do like to skip around and, and listen to different ones. Yeah, I, I'm I'm probably the similar. My my podcast app is just full of all sorts of podcasts. I listen to a lot of entrepreneurial stuff, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff about podcasting, which essentially, ironically, it's very meta. But uh, I learned pretty much everything I know about podcasting from podcasts about podcasting. Um, but some of the OT ones, like I said before, I I really love um, Sarah's the OT for life podcast which is l y f e even the spelling's interesting um but one of the other ones i've only just recently found is uh erica del pozo's uh burnt out to lit up uh and she's an ot and she records it with her husband michael who's a pt i think but we won't hold that against him um cool. but it's it's essentially about uh a burnout so it's from that a sort of an occupational perspective it's, it's really interesting I, I like that one a lot so there's a there's a lot out there um, there's also the Seniors Flourish one, which I like, even though it's not an area mm -hmm. that I'm familiar with or have ever worked in, uh, being aged care. Uh, I think Mandy's, she's one that I listen to for, like like um, Stefan was saying, uh, interview style and that kind of thing. I, I think um, Mandy Chamberlain does a really good job with that one as well. That's great. Thank you. We have so many interesting questions here. It's where to begin. Um, one person asked us, um, have you any sponsors for your podcast? I don't. And um, it's not something that I'm looking for or to make any money on. Uh, but Stephanie and Brock, have, have that been something that you've been thinking about, getting sponsors? 
I'm in the same boat as you, Karen. I don't, and it's not something that I'm looking to do in the near future. Yeah, I'm the same. One of the the people that I help with theirs um, did have a sponsor, and I think the sponsor was mainly for the initial equipment to start. Uh, that was the Grey Revolution podcast, which, again, ironically, is another aged care podcast. Um but yeah, I think Sam for that one, I think the sponsor was mainly for the equipment to start. But yeah, it's not something that I've considered or really I'm not overly interested in. I like having full creative control and I, I really don't like ads. I don't like ads in podcasts I listen to, so I'd feel really bad putting them in one that I'm actually making. So, Brock, someone asked, um, Drew asked if you could list those podcasts again that you enjoy. Uh, yep. So OT for Life, which is OT number four L Y F E, uh, and I believe it's a lot, a lot of these podcasts will just have a website. So if you can Google uh, or search on your podcast app, um, the other one Erica's was uh, Burnt Out to Lit Up, L I T Up, uh, and Sam's was a Grey Revolution. Uh, which is another aged care one, and Seniors Flourish is Mandy Chamberlain's. Great. Thank, thank there's, you. There's, there's a heap more. If you, literally, if you go into your podcast app, whether that's Apple Podcasts or Overcast or Stitcher or whatever podcast app you use and you search for occupational therapy, it'll bring up usually the majority of um, OT-related kind of podcasts. So we we have people from all around the world. It's it's very exciting. And and Peter, um, who is in Ghana, said uh, it's amazing listening to us. Uh, how can I contribute to your production so you can add OT information from our parts of the world? Peter, reach out to us. Um, we'd love to interview you. In fact, yeah. um, this whole um, webinar is going to appear, appear on the WFOT website, WFOT.org. But we each decided we're going to take pieces of it and, and put some of it on our podcast. So it would be fun um, after people have been on this podcast to reach out to us and we could maybe do some interviews and add to it um, or separate segments. So um, anybody, please do that. Um, Samir um, wrote something that I thought would be interesting. Uh, one of the things that he asked was, how many hours in a week would you say you're committed to the development and execution of your podcast? Um, do you get paid or is this something you all do as a volunteer on top of your day job? Um, so uh, who'd like to answer that? Stephanie, why don't we all answer it? Stephanie and Brock, why don't you go first? Um, sure. I, uh, I, oh, go ahead. Good. Okay. Uh, I think, yeah, on terms of the outcome, I I personally don't think it takes a lot of time. Uh, it's one of the, I'll start, okay, I'll start at the end. It's No, I don't get paid for it. It's definitely a passion project. Um, it costs me a little bit of money uh, just to, like, host it for the media hosts and my website and that kind of stuff, but... It's a hobby, essentially, so I, I enjoy it. So that that's not a big deal to me. Uh, I, in terms of time, the the more I do it, the faster I'm getting at editing and that kind of stuff. And I'm kind of at one to one with my editing at the moment. So if it's an hour and a half interview, I can usually get it to a basic edit standard in an hour and a half. Um, I, other than that, it doesn't a lot of the time taken up is just waiting for things so generally if i interview someone i will interview it interview them i'll record it oh sorry i'll edit it into essentially a podcast format um with the like steph was saying before that the intro outro um record my little intro thing at the start etc then i send it to them so they can have a listen to and they have final say about you know if there's anything they want me to cut out but it's like waiting for them to have a listen and get it back to me. That kind of stuff is, is sort of the thing that makes, takes up the main sort of time for the whole process, but that doesn't take up any of my time kind of thing. So I would say I might spend, I guess if you average it out maybe an hour a week 
Um, I probably spend a little bit more just stuffing around and trying new things with my website and that kind of stuff, but I could easily get away with an hour a week. I tend to batch record as well. So at the moment, I've got probably four or five already recorded, ready to go. And then it'll be a longer break sort of between when I record that. Well, actually, that's a lie. I'm recording one in a couple of hours, but generally (laughs) there'll be a break uh, sort of a couple of weeks or a few weeks before I record another one. Um, So that, that kind of freeze it up and I can work that around my, my lifestyle and what's going on with my life. So, Great, Brock. Thank you. Stephanie, how about you? Um, some similarities here. I, would, I, I don't make any money at doing it. I um, do it sometimes during business hours, but for the most part, it's just on my own time. And um, like Brock, I don't spend a ton of extra time doing it, but I do consider it a hobby. Really, it's it's something I like to do, so I don't mind the time that I spend. I'm pretty much at a one-on-one in however long it takes me to record. It usually takes me about that long to then edit it and, and get it ready to go, upload it to the different um, po- podcast hosting sites. One thing that I did not expect to take time and energy that really does is the pre-interview component and that it entails kind of the research in on my part of finding guests who will come on the show and then scheduling them or planning together with them a time that will work for both of our schedules. And so some that's sometimes more difficult than it seems like it would be. Um, I did create an intake survey and it's actually a Google poll that I just send the link out to when somebody contacts me or I contact them and say, hey, you know, we be on the show when they say yes, I send them the survey and it asks them things like, are there any special topics you'd like to talk about? You know, what resources might you share? You know, things like that. Um, And also ask them to upload a picture of themselves so I can post that on the podcast website whenever I release the episode. Also, like Brock, I tend to um, back record or um, record interviews and create episodes well in advance of when they're released. And mainly I do that because my work schedule is heavier during some times of the year and I know I'll have less time to spend on podcasting. And so I I kind of um, upload those and have them ready to go in advance. And so it's there is a way to do that and you can get better balance through that yeah thank you thank you stephanie yeah there's so many similarities between what we we all do um i i look at podcasting as a meaningful occupation for me um it's 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 wonderful i i find that wherever i am and someone asked a question you know how how do you get these speakers I feel like I'm constantly, wherever I am, um, and I hear someone t- share a story. I was at an assistive technology conference last Friday, and the keynote speaker um, was a actress with autism. And after the, that keynote was finished, I uh, looked for her and I said, you know, do you have a half hour that we can go sit in a corner and can I interview you? And she had a lot of experience with occupational therapy. Um, I, at that conference, saw a vendor whose son um, was blind and they had started uh, a business um, called Everything Patrick. And it turned out the mom was an OT and went into another corner and interviewed her, um, Mm -hmm. uploaded those interviews to Dropbox where Andrea, um, again, puts together these episodes and similar to Stephanie um, and Brock, um, she does back record and get them all set so these episodes can can be released. And we have a backup, a um, backlog of of interviews. I think we probably have maybe six or seven um, episodes that uh, Andrea just has to put together. Um, We've got somebody from from Germany, and I want to throw this out for everybody, and let's see, let's see um, how we can we can answer this question. Um, this is Christina from Germany, and she said OTs are working hard, 
um, to be respected within the professional field of healthcare. There's much work around um, building a stronger identity of the profession. Uh, do you have experience on how OTs are perceived maybe more differently through contributing and podcasts? Um, Brock or, or Stephanie, um, how about let's share some thoughts about that? You know, maybe the thought of, you know, can a podcast be used um, as a marketing strategy to build the status of occupational therapy um, in, a, in a country? I definitely yes. think it can. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and and perhaps you know, um, uh, Christina, you can subscribe to our podcast and get a sense of you know what we're doing, but make it culturally relevant um, for for Germany. I think that's that's key with any of these podcasts because we we have people from all over the world on today and. It's important to see what makes sense um, for you uh, in your own country. So one thing I probably would add is because this is a topic that comes up quite a lot on my podcast. Um, but in saying that, it would depend on whether you're looking for your own identity or whether you're looking to prefer uh, to um, showcase the profession to a wider audience. So my podcast is typically, and I think all of ours, we or probably not. Um, Karen's, but we're specifically looking at this is for OTs kind of thing. So if I'm looking at trying to promote the, the profession to a wider audience, my podcast probably isn't the one to do it. One thing I would say is in your country, if you have a listen, there's going to be podcasts, uh, say, yeah, with regards to your clinical area. Reach out to them and see if you can have a chat with the, the host of that podcast. You might be able to showcase what an OT can offer to say a podcast around you know whatever your clinical area is say it's aged care or say it's mental health um but try and i guess spread that uh ot uh identity to outside of the profession but find some put some podcasts that are specific to whatever country you're in yeah i agree with that and, and i will say that um part of what my mission in creating and, and hosting the on the air podcast is that is recruitment of students and, and future practitioners into the OT field. And, and I do have, I, I can't keep up with the background of everybody that's a listener, but I do have a number of listeners who are just people thinking about going into OT or who are on waiting lists or preparing to apply. So they're getting their prerequisites to apply to OT school. And they, they it just gives them an idea of the breadth and the depth that we can go into in different specialty areas in our profession. Yeah, I think it's a, a fabulous marketing tool. And, and even though um, at this point, I can't say lifestyle by design is only an occupational therapy, um, uh, interview uh, audience, um, I believe that because I identify myself as an occupational therapist, because I integrate occupational therapy whenever I can, <laughs> um, I feel that it, it's, it's a very good marketing tool for, um, for the profession as well. Um, so it, it has a, 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 a maybe a different um, audience. Key terms are really important um, with your episodes as well, um, and that helps people uh, find find your your podcast too. So we have we've got a couple more questions here. Um, Mush um, asked some questions, and Stephanie and 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 Brock. Let's see if we can answer. They're they're a little bit more challenging. Um, the question is, what are the ethical implications concerns? minefields to be careful aware of and what are intellectual property of the podcast uh, for the people that were interviewed well I'll, I'll start off and say that the most obvious ethical concern is you know not mentioning names of any clients or or even descriptive information that might allow somebody to guess who a client or former client was. Um, and we don't want to ever do that, of course, in our discussions on the show. So that's that's a big one. 
definitely want to uphold the confidentiality and, and HIPAA laws there. Yeah, very important. And we had another question about concerning the people you interviewed, do you upload their personal information or is it up to them? You know, one of the things that I ask somebody ahead of time, uh, typically, is um, would you like to share your contact information? Because many people, like for example, um, LN Vincent, who was on my podcast, that's the woman running for um, Boston City Council, um, she get, shared uh, her contact information because she's running for, for office where another person might um, decide, well, I just want to be interviewed and I'd rather not have that information out there. So you have to ask ahead of time. That's really important. Yes, yeah, and sure. I'd agree with that. That's yeah. something I do as well. Like people, oh, I'll ask like, you know, is there, because some people will have one thing they might want to put their Twitter out there or something. Um, other people will put everything out there. Uh, it's completely up to the person. As for intellectual property, uh, not an issue I've come up against yet, but I think I, I give complete control to the, um, the, the person that I'm talking to, uh, where if, like I said at the, before, like I'll give them the episode before it's released there, they can tell me if there's anything, like I'm not here to get anyone in trouble. I don't want them to feel uncomfortable with what's being put out. So they have complete hundred percent say over what stays in and what comes out. Um, I've had some, I've had, I don't think I've only had one person that wanted one specific thing to come out. And I think from memory that was because they coughed or it wasn't even actually a, a content thing. Um, <laughs> but again, like if someone came to me and said, oh, you know, I've changed jobs and I, I don't want that up anymore, like I take it down. That's, I'm like, it's just a hobby for me. I don't get anything out of, you know, fighting people for that. There's no point. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm just here to, I guess, not service, well, I guess kind of service uh, OT as a profession. Um, but yeah, it's completely up to them what stays up, what goes, what doesn't get put in, that kind of thing. So I guess to that degree, the intellectual property is still theirs. I, I don't claim to own it. I've heard that um, in in dealing with things that involve copyright infringement and trademark type of things that if you stick to the policy of being nice, don't tell lies, don't reveal secrets, um, you know, don't steal content, including music, um, that, that you'll generally be okay. Um, you do want to probably, if you're thinking about podcasting, understand a little bit about copyright law. And, and copyright is really more of a bundle of rights that means that when you put something out that you have created, that you are the owner of that. And it, as such, the protection exists, whether or not you register it or put a copyright notice on it or anything like that. So then anybody who then might use that. So if somebody then tried to re-record your podcast recording and put it out as their own or whatever, you could in theory sue them for copyright infringement. Um, that's not usually anything that comes up in podcasting that much, but it could. Yeah, that's a, that's a good, um, good advice as well. Now, um, we just have a little bit of time, but Samir asked us, any advice on how to come up with a catchy podcast name? So, um, Brock and Stephanie, how'd you come up with your name? I'll, yeah. I'll go. Um, I, go. <laughs> I've thought about it for a long time, probably several months, and, and i several times thought of something and searched and there was already something out there with that exact name that didn't have anything to do with OT. So I, I thought it was problematic. Um, and, and it just kind of came to me in the middle of the night one night. And um, like a lot of good ideas do, you know, at inter-opportune times when I had to find a way to write it down so I'd make sure I remembered it. Um, in my title, there are a few other podcasts that are not related to OT at all that are called on the air or on the air something else. But 
um, you know, there's nothing with a similar logo or that does the capitalization kind of in the middle of the work, you know, the same way that I do. So I wanted something, I think the my biggest tip with that would be, um, besides just ponder it for a while, is to be clear on what the objective or the goal of your podcast might be and what your target audience might be. So that if you want it to be specific, like seniors flourish um, or the OT school bus, you know, if you're talking about pediatric or geriatric OT or mental health or any of that, you might center it around that. But if it's going to be more general, then you don't want to pigeonhole yourself with a title. Yeah, Stephanie, that's yeah. great advice. Yeah, I, I'd agree. And because like my podcast is quite general, my name is quite general. Um, and I just wanted something short, easy to remember, easy to find. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. It just came to me that that's what I wanted to call it, I guess. And um, we're, we'll conclude in a second. Mine actually came in 1998. Um, I just thought, let's think about our life and how we can design it and be, you know, um, autonomous in it. Um, what became really fun for, for me was once I um, started working with Andrea, she had so many resources. So we have our own music uh, design. We have our own logo um, that we had a work study um, student put together and it just it just came together so nicely um, and I feel like it it's it's left it open to to address just about anything which is what I wanted as our topic so we're going to have to conclude today um, we want to thank everybody for being here we want to um, thank WFOT for uh, having these virtual um, webinars, virtual VX webinars. Um, we're so thrilled to be part of this. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and it is recorded. It'll be on the WFOT website. Please be in touch with us. Um, we are here to mentor you and um, we're thrilled to be part of this global community and podcasting is just another way of us promoting occupational therapy. Um, thank you so much, Brock and Stephanie, for being on today. This was so much fun. And um, again, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you.